Okay, so if you didn't come to lab on Monday, remember that you have another opportunity or maybe you were signed up for Wednesday. So we also have lab today, which is at two o'clock, right? Same room, same time, same place. Are there any questions about anything before we start today? Remember that you're going to have another quiz on Monday, and it's only going to be over the third and the fourth lectures, so since the quiz that we took on Monday. And remember that you have the opportunity to look at the, at the video online because I'm posting them on Canvas. So if you missed Monday's lecture, you can find it there. Also, there is online homework. So remember that the homework is going to be over the information um, specifically on chemistry this week, chapter two of your book, and it is uh, found on Canvas too. It's really important to actually just look at the, um, instead of looking at the assignments, where you can click on the assignments on the side page of Canvas, if you just scroll down from the home page, it goes week by week. And so we are on week two of the course. And that's where you would find the assignments as well as the um, videos. Okay. So can anybody tell me something about lipids that they that we learned a, last Monday? What did we learn about lipids? They are non-polar, which means that they tend to be hydrophobic which they're repelled by water. What is an example of a lipid that we talked about? We're going to talk about some more examples of lipids today too. Saturated fats. And so unsaturated and saturated fats are examples of triglycerides. And the which one is more common in plants versus animals? Unsaturated. So the unsaturated fats are believed to be more healthy for you because they're they have been linked to lower incidences of cardiovascular disease. And then there's actually been, if you've been kind of following dietary habits, there's kind of been a push to add more fat into the diet um, as opposed to having low fat diets. And so now they've kind of changed their mind and they decided that fat is actually a good thing for us in our diet. We'll talk about cholesterol in a minute. So when we look at the lipids, um, another example of a lipid is what we refer to as the steroids. So this would be in your notes under lipids. It would be with triglycerides. So triglycerides are one type of lipid, steroids are another. And you'll notice that they use the shorthand in organic chemistry. And so we have rings of carbon. So even though you don't see that, the carbon would be in these rings. And the characteristic of all steroids is, is that they are composed of four carbon rings. So four carbon ringed molecules. So this includes cholesterol. So cholesterol is not saturated or unsaturated because it is a, not a triglyceride. So it is a steroid. And we actually have to have cholesterol in our diet. It's actually really important because it is a precursor to um, some really important steroids, including um, estrogen and testosterone. So this is a precursor to estrogen and testosterone. So we have enzymes that convert cholesterol to these. And so you'll notice this is actually estrogen. So this is a female in right? And this is what determines the secondary sex characteristics like coloration like size, right? like this bright plumage on the tail. 
So the testosterone is very similar to cholesterol, or excuse me, estrogen and cholesterol. They're very similar in structure. And it's kind of interesting because in your body, you can actually convert one form to another. So for example, you can produce estrogen and then convert it to testosterone. So males don't, aren't the only creatures that have testosterone. Females have testosterone. They just have lower levels of testosterone than males. Males also have estrogen. And um, those are really uh, important hormones in the body. But they're steroid, which makes it interesting because they are not soluble in water. So it's a question of how are they transported? And so all of these, these uh, steroids have to be bound to proteins in order to be transported. So they must be bound to proteins to be transported. So testosterone is not just free in the blood. It is surrounded by proteins and the proteins are polar and so they take things into solution. However, if we look at these proteins that transport cholesterol, this is what you actually get when you get your cholesterol measured. And so you might have heard of them as lipoproteins. These are the proteins that transport steroids, including cholesterol. And when you get your cholesterol measured, it's LDL and HDL. And that stands for low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein. So probably a lot of you are too young to have had your cholesterol checked. But which is the one that you do not want to have a high concentration of in your blood? This one. So you think, whoa, that should be good, right? But this is the bad one. So L LDL is the bad one. And so, for example, when I get tested, my LDL levels are slightly elevated. But weirdly, they also are my HDL. So they call this the LDL, even though it is a lipoprotein, this is what they call bad cholesterol. This is good cholesterol. So I am a weird one in that I have bad, but I also have high levels of good, which they think might counteract the effect on my cardiovascular system. So what they're worried about when you have high levels of bad cholesterol is, is that it is going to transport cholesterol and it is going to get deposited in your arteries and it's going to lead to a heart attack, right? Or it could lead to a stroke because you could get blocked blood vessels going to your brain. So they found that diet plays a role, but interestingly, it's not the dietary cholesterol. So the old adage that you shouldn't eat egg yolks is kind of out the door. They now think that you can eat egg yolks up to you know a certain limit in moderation, right? And that is not going to affect you, but other things do affect this. And so, for example, smoking is a big problem in that it elevates LDL. Uh, lack of exercise also is correlated, and obesity is correlated with LDL. But if you exercise and eat well and don't smoke, then you tend to have good HDL. So my LDL runs in my family. So I have a genetic predisposition to heart disease because of my high LDL. So they can put you on drugs for that, but the, the uh, drugs have bad side effects in my family as well. So it's best to not take the drugs. Are there any questions about this idea of steroids? So another example of a steroid that you might have heard of is cortisol. Where have you maybe heard that word before? What? Asthma? 
Yeah, maybe asthma. What else? You might have heard other words that are related to this. So for example, you might have heard of hydrocortisone. Right? Hydrocortisone is a cream you can buy over the counter. And the interesting thing about lipids is, is that although they are not soluble in water, they actually can pass right through your skin. So when you put testosterone and estrogen cream on your skin, it will actually get into your circulation. If you put like a protein on your surface of your skin, it's not going to be able to get through the skin. So hydrocortisone is like a cream. And when would you use hydrocortisone? Itch relief, Itch relief right? So this reduces inflammation. Has anybody had a cortisone shot? Yes. So that is probably in a joint, right? So when you get inflammation in joints or if you have arthritis, they say, well, we can give you a cortisone shot, which will temporarily relieve the inflammation, the chronic long-term inflammation that you might have due to arthritis. Okay. So if we look at where this steroid is produced in the body, this is actually produced by the adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands sit right above your kidneys, and they actually have two uh, types of tissue in them, but the glandular tissue produces cortisol, and it produces it in response to stress. So cortisol is produced in response to stress. For example, for example, I recently saw a, a scientific article looking at cortisol level in fish as they have to travel up the fish ladders. And so they kind of concluded that fish that have to travel up those fish ladders have higher levers, levels of cortisol in them because it's stressful to their system. So we're not the only ones that use this as a stress hormone. So some of the things that cortisol does, besides decreasing inflammation, is it increases glucose levels. So this would be getting ready to do action. Right? And there's actually diseases that are actually related to diabetes, or type of diabetes, where the cortisol actually increases your glucose levels and you become pre-diabetic because you're just so stressed out. So this is a, a really interesting chemical and there's a molecule and there's all kinds of research now looking at it because they believe that in our society, in our culture, we are too stressed out. And we're stressed out over things that we should not be stressed out. So for example, um, you can have like mini stress attacks, like 50 of them during the day, right? And instead of it being like life-threatening, it could be like, I can't find my keys, right? Or somebody texted me something that made me mad, right? And so you have these responses, these stress responses that we almost all, or most of us kind of live at a high level of stress. And so they think that this cortisol is having all kinds of negative effects on our physiology, on our bodies. And so this can be why maybe some diseases are becoming more prevalent. So I'm just going to show you a little video that's kind of fun because it is a cartoon of the effects of cortisol and what the cortisol does in your body. Oops, sorry, no volume. It should be. Oops. Ah, 
oh, my videos are gonna work today. Sorry. So cortisol also kind of makes you angry, right? <laughs> I can, I can. <laughs> it affects your digestive fire, right? So it kind of dampens digestion, stresses you out, right? Okay, we won't watch the video because it's not fun without the, without the, um, I'll have to figure out what's going on with the speakers. Okay. Okay, so I'll put that video in Canvas under week two if you so desire to watch it. The other, the last example of a lipid that we're going to talk about are the waxes. And so the waxes are really interesting because oftentimes they can be structural. So we can talk about the wax that bees produce. And so bees eat their own honey that is created from pollen. And then they actually have um, wax glands that they um, produce little flakes of wax onto their abdomens. And then the workers, they chew that, and then you can see them, they actually use their mandibles, their jaws, in order to build the honeycomb. And so wax is an example of a very uh, long um, carbon chain molecule. So it wax would be an example of an organic um, lipid. When we look at the waxes that are produced by some fruits, um, the waxes, um, that you can shine up, right? The, the natural wax that is found on fruits, that is also um, an example of a lipid. And where in our body do we produce wax? In our ears. And it is actually really annoying to me, earwax is. I don't know if it's to the rest of you. But this earwax, it has antimicrobial properties. And it actually has a, um, a name. It's called cerumen. So that's earwax. And it has antimicrobial properties, so it actually helps to protect against infection. The interesting thing about this wax is it's produced and into the ear, but then the cells in the lining of the ear actually migrate to move the wax towards the opening. So sometimes that doesn't work very well, right? And then what you want to do is put a Q-tip in there. But the problem is if you get the wax up against your tympanic membrane, it's not going to ever come out properly, and it's going to affect your ability to hear. So you might have to go to the doctor and with a microscope, and you might have to like pull out with specialized tweezers earwax that gets stuck next to your eardrum. You might also experience um, when you heat up the earwax, it tends to flow better. And so if you have a fever, I've, you know, I've noticed that when I have a fever, I produce my, all my earwax comes out because it heats up and then it turns into a liquid and it comes out. And that's the idea of like using warm water to flush the wax out of your ears. Um, and that is also behind the idea of you might have seen those in the health food stores, those candles. So they have this tube of paper you put down here and you light a flame and it causes warm air to come into the ear canal and then it kind of sucks the wax out. They call it candle in your ear. I wouldn't recommend that, but kind of like fire of ear and hair kind of together. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay. Oh, I lied. The, the last lipid that we're going to talk about is the phospholipids. And the phospholipids are really important because these are the molecules that make up plasma membranes. So they make up the plasma membranes. So if we look at a plasma membrane like in a book, oftentimes they'll have these structures that look like this. 
So this is like a three-dimensional depiction of what a phospholipid looks like. And so they call this end the head end. And these are the tails. The head end is polar. The tail end is nonpolar. So what that means is, is that the head end will be attracted to water because of its polarity. So it is hydrophilic. The head end would be hydrophilic. The tails are repelled by water, so they are hydrophobic. And so if we look at the basis, you know, what's going on in terms of atomic structure, molecular structure in our phospholipid, it looks something like this. Okay, so this is a diagram I just got off the internet. But you can see that it has this negative charge on the head end that is going to be attracted to water, the hydrogen part of the water. water. And then notice that it has these long chains of carbon that are nonpolar, right? So remember, organic chemistry shorthand, right? Every time there is a little pink, this is a carbon, right? And then they didn't draw the hydrogens, but they would be there as well. So that is the structure. So the really interesting thing happens if you put a bunch of these in water. So if you put a bunch of them in water, they will orient in a structure that looks like this. The head ends are attracted to water and the tail ends are repelled. So they'll form what is called a bilayer. And so this is my phospholipid bilayer. And that's your plasma membrane. If I, uh, even if I put, just put these in water, they would tend to create a sphere or more like a balloon. So if you think about a ball that is, uh, maybe a water balloon, water balloon that, is, that has water inside and water outside, and then this would be the boundary. So the crazy thing is, is, is that these are non-living, but just because of their properties, they'll tend to form spheres. Right? And so this is one of the ways that we think that cells may have first arrived on the planet is, is that you created these spheres and chemical, different chemical reactions occur inside than outside, and then you start to regulate those chemical reactions. Okay? So that is, um, those are the phospholipids. Okay, so we talked about carbohydrates, like sugars, like glucose and starch and glycogen. We talked about lipids, and now we're going to talk about proteins. So there's actually four different groups. So the proteins are super important. These are the biologically active molecules. They are very diverse. And in most cases, they have very complex three-dimensional structures. So can anybody give me a name of a specific protein that you have in your body? Can you name one specific molecule that would be like a protein? Like, like um, cholesterol is a lipid. What might be a protein? In lab, if we did lab on Monday, what was the protein that was used to break down sucrose? What kind of molecule was it? What was it? Sorry, I couldn't hear. It was outside. Okay. Okay. So examples. Enzymes. Right. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, so they cause them to occur. The types of chemical reactions that are kind of important include catabolic reactions,
So catabolic, think catastrophe, think breaking down. So catabolic means to break something down, okay? So this is breaking substances into smaller pieces. This is really important in digestion, right? We have to be able to break stuff down, to break down proteins, and then we use those proteins to build other proteins that are important in our bodies. Okay? So we eat meat, we eat um, starch, okay? So what is the opposite of catabolic? Does anybody know? What is it when you build tissue, when you build molecules? Steroids are said, sometimes said to be what? They tend to cause you to be more muscly, testosterone, for example. So they are, oh, nobody knows, anabolic. Anabolic steroids, anabolic reactions, right? These build molecules. So, for example, in our body, <clears throat> glucose could be converted in between glycogen. Remember, I said glycogen is what stores glucose in the liver and in the muscles, and then you can break it back down. So, going in one way, that would be what? Anabolic or catabolic? This top arrow. Anabolic. The bottom arrow, catabolic. Okay. Enzyme or enzymes can do this, our proteins can be built the same way. So proteins are made up of amino acids. And so you can take those proteins and you can build or those amino acids and you can put them together to form a protein. And then that protein can be broken back down. So this would be anabolic, and that would be catabolic. So typically, enzymes are used to do this, right? They catalyze the chemical reaction. So enzymes, they're used to build, and they're also used to break down. So they're not just to break down, but we also have to use them to build. So enzymes are said to be globular proteins. So I'll put types of proteins. The first type of protein is the globular. So glob means just what it says. It is this weird three-dimensional structure that will determine its function. So we say globular proteins are highly folded. They are also soluble in water. However, they are easily unfolded. And this is what is referred to as denaturation. So that means that they are unstable. Okay. So enzymes can unfold and then they won't work anymore. I did want to mention that sometimes when you go to the grocery store, they say, you'll look at something and I'll say, live enzymes, right? And it's like, enzymes aren't alive, right? Enzymes are either active or inactive. So if they are folded and they're folded in the proper configuration, they are active. If they're unfolded, then they become deactivated, denatured, and they are no longer active. When you look at the grocery store and they say live cultures, that is true. Those are living, generally, microorganisms like bacteria and yeast. So some of the food that you purchase now, like yogurt and kefir and other kombucha, those all have living organisms inside of them. And so you're digesting those as uh, probiotics. Okay, so that's globular. We also have structural proteins. 
right? These are less folded. They are, uns are not soluble in water, insoluble. And they are very stable. So they are not easily denatured. So an example of a structural protein that we have in our bones and in our skin and kind of like everywhere in our body is collagen. So collagen is a structural protein. It is white. And so this is what gives our bones the white color. Um, it is found underneath your skin, so when your body stops producing so much collagen, then you start to wrinkle. Now, there is another type of structural protein that is found in our hair and in our skin and in our nails. So does anybody know what that structural protein is called? Sometimes you see it on shampoo bottles. Anybody know what it's called? It starts with a K. Keratin, somebody whispered it. Okay, so keratin is a structural protein that is found in your hair, your skin, your nails. If we look at other examples of uh, proteins that are globular, this would include things like hemoglobin. So other examples. Hemoglobin binds oxygen and transports it throughout our body. It would be a globular structure, globular protein. We also have antibodies, which are part of our immune system. Those would be globular in structure. We have clotting proteins that allow our blood to clot. So those would also be globular. We talked about enzymes. So when we get to genetics, we're gonna talk about the significance of the proteins and their structure because that is what is coded in our genetic material. So the, our genetic material produces proteins and those proteins are what then produce the rest of the um, types of molecules in our body. So this is a diagram showing a primary. You do not need to know these different stages of structure. It just has to do with how folded they are. So here is my primary structure, which is just a strand of amino acid. Then the amino acids will um, form hydrogen bonds with one another. So there's some hydrogen bonding going on, which is weak attraction of oppositely charged parts of the molecule. So there would be like little dotted lines, right? And then we get more complex structure forming. And then in the end, we have a structure called hemoglobin, or actually that's not hemoglobin, but this is another, this is just a, a sample of a protein structure. Hemoglobin actually has four globins. So that would be globular. These structural proteins generally only have the secondary, so they tend to be more structural in there um, and less globular. They tend to um, have a, more, a very more simple structure. Okay, so the last type of organic molecule we're going to talk about are the nucleic acids. So the nucleic acids would include our DNA. Okay. So DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid. The DNA is made up of nucleotides. And these nucleotides are units, basic units of the DNA that have within them 
um, bases. And so you might have seen the bases as labeled as A, G, T, and C. So we have four different bases. So it is a really simple molecule compared to proteins, which have like, I think we have 20 different amino acids that can be strung together in any, or in any order. Okay? So it's a simple molecule. And these four bases just get strung together and that creates our genetic code. So the sequences of A, G, T's, and C's creates the code that then um, codes for protein. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about DNA and um, how it does code for protein. So I'm not gonna go into detail here. Another example of a nucleic acid is ATP. So we talked about ATP previously when we were talking about cellular respiration and producing the production of ATP. So this is adenosine triphosphate. And I would never make you write that out, right? I wouldn't say, what does ATP, like in a short answer question, right? But if you see adenosine triphosphate, that is what ATP is, like you're reading about in your book. Okay. Um, the tri part is actually very important. So we have um, a, um, a, we'll just put A, and then we have three phosphate groups. Okay. This last phosphate bond is very high energy. So I'll put this as a high energy bond. And it is actually a covalent bond because they're sharing of electrons. So ATP can be bro broken down. So I could have it going in one direction and then being rebuilt as ADP. So it would be A with two Ps. A. Plus P plus energy. Okay. So this is what is called adenosine diphosphate. So this is ADP. So what I've done in my body when I get ready to move my muscles is I break this covalent bond. And then it energizes the skeletal, the muscles, the, the muscle fibers in my, in my skeletal muscles. And then they can use this energy to cause the muscle to contract. Then um, when I'm ready, I can use the energy that, is, that I get from breaking down glucose to rebuild my ATP. So this would be catabolic, and this is anabolic, right? So I'm breaking down ATP, but I could also always produce more. So this is breaking down, and this is building. Okay. So that phosphate bond is really important. It's really amazing that we kind of discovered the whole basis for the, the, this basic uh, currency of energy in our body all based upon atoms sharing electrons. Okay. So there is a picture of a um, nucleotide. And so they have a base, so this would be like A, G, T, or C. And then we'll talk about the sugar. Our DNA actually has a sugar backbone. And then the phosphate group. So that is a structure of a nucleotide that would make up our DNA. This is the ATP. This is the base, adenine. There's another sugar, sugar, and then there's the phosphate groups. Okay. So this is my DNA molecule. We're going to talk a lot about this, but I just wanted to point out that our DNA, our genetic material, has two strands. And so what do you think these dotted lines represent? What type of bonds? Hydrogen bonds. Are they weak or are they strong? Weak, right? And so we have this hydrogen bonding going on in our DNA molecule. 
And so if you heat up our DNA, it will actually come apart. And that is the whole basis for taking DNA and making many copies of it in the lab, is that we could heat it up, pull it down, heat it up, pull it down. We heat it up, they come apart, and new strand is built. So the, the DNA can actually make copies of itself. All this, the um, regular solid lines would represent covalent bonds, right? All of these are covalent bonds. Okay. So we are starting on chapter three today from your book, and this has to do with the cell biology. Remember, we talked about cell theory as a scientific theory that all cells today come from pre-existing cells. Oops. From pre And that cells are alive, right? When we looked at all those, the DNA and the proteins and the lipids, those are all non-living. So this is the first level where we see the characteristics of life. Sometimes we see organisms that are unicellular. Uni means that they have just one cell. So can you give me an example of an organism that is unicellular? Amoeba. Amoeba, excellent. You might have studied or looked at paramecium, right? Amoeba are examples of unicellular. Um, prokaryotes, or excuse me, sorry, unicellular eukaryotes, but also bacteria. And that is as opposed to multicellular organisms, which means many cells. And so this would be plants, fungi, and animals. Now we can also talk about two different types of cells. So when we look in the fossil record in the history of the world, of the planet, of our planet, we see that the first types to, type of cell to arise is what is said to be po prokaryotic cells. So in terms of this word, I mentioned that biology has this crazy vocabulary, right, that generally has roots that are put together. Cary means nucleus means like nuts. So this is peri, so this is before pro preceding the nucleus, right? So this is before a nucleus. So these cells have no nucleus. They have no internal organelles. We'll talk about what an organelle is in a minute. An organelle is just a partition where different chemical reactions occur in different parts of a cell, but they don't have the internal organelles. And they also have interesting DNA. They have plasmid DNA. And this is rings. And so instead of chromosomes, they have plasmids. So this is a ring of DNA. So no chromosomes. And the interesting thing about this ring of DNA within the bacteria, so let me draw my little bacteria here. So I could draw bacteria around here. This is my ring of DNA. I have kind of a bunch of them. These rings of DNA could actually, the bacteria can actually get rid of some and then it can pick some up from its environment. 
So it can actually exchange genetic material with its environment, which is probably the reason why bacteria, for example, are um, able to evolve really quickly to their environment and become resistant to antibiotics. Because if the gene is present in their environment, they can pick it up or they can get rid of it. So these would be the bacteria. Only bacteria are prokaryotic. Everything else that is made up of cells would be a different type of cell, which is called a eukaryotic. So anytime you see EU in front of a word, that means good. Like eutrophic means good feeding. This means that they have a nucleus, they have a good nucleus. So they have nuclei, a nucleus present. They have organelles present. They have chromosomes. And so you sometimes see chromosomes is drawn like this. Right, so their genetic material is organized into a chromosome. This is actually a chromosome that has replicated, but you sometimes see pictures of them. Okay. And this would be all other so we are oops, organisms, we are eukaryotic and we are multicellular. Fungi are eukaryotic. Plants are eukaryotic, multicellular. So all other living organisms. So if we look at a diagram of a bacteria, actually, this is a diagram. So this shows the size. So um, this is what you can see with the naked eye. So you might be able to see a human egg. They definitely see a frog egg, which is a single cell. But most of the cells that we're going to look at are microscopic. So animal cells, you cannot see with the naked eye. You have to use a microscope. Plant cells. And then notice that big bacteria are actually much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And so that is significant because as the cell gets bigger, it has more volume, and we need to partition it up. So that's probably the reason why we have eukaryotic cells having partitions, and then the bacteria are small and they do not have partitions internally. And then you can compare this, this is a logarithmic scale. We can see if it's with an electron microscope and we can see proteins, and I'll show you some diagrams of, of using an electron microscope. Um, but that, I think Adam would fall at that opposite range, it's like we can, can't see that. Structure. <clears throat> okay, so this is my bacterium. So this is what causes, for example, or would be an example of E. coli, diphtheria, cholera, some pathogenic bacteria. But we also have lots of good bacteria in our digestive tract, for example, that are really important because they produce lots of uh, chemicals that we need, including vitamin K. We have bacteria in our and they're going to produce our vitamin K, and then we absorb it from them. The, what they're showing in here are the plasmids. So these are all the rings of DNA. So this is an example of a eukaryotic cell. So we can see that there is a central nucleus, and within that nucleus, that is where the DNA, that is where the genetic material stays. And then all of the other structures play important functions as kind of described by this, this outline. Um, one significant difference, right? There's two significant differences between plant cells versus animal cells. So let's look at plant cells. They have a cell wall. What structure, structural polysaccharide produces that cell wall? What is the molecule? Does anybody remember from the lecture on Monday? Cellulose. So the cell wall is made of cellulose. So that is its, is its internal skeleton. Right? They also have 
chloroplasts. What are what is the function of the chloroplasts? Does anybody know? What can plants do that we cannot do? Photosynthesis, right? So this is where photosynthesis takes place. So that chloroplasts have chlorophyll, which gives them their green color, and they're capable of photosynthesis. So I'm not going to talk a lot about plants. In Biology 102, Sasha McKeon will talk about plants, but I'm going to focus on animals in this uh, quarter. So we're going to talk about the animal structure of the animal cell. Oops. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, oh, sorry, is the nucleus. Okay, so this is, you can put animal cell and then you can put nucleus. The nucleus is, has a double membrane. So it's actually a, a layered membrane and it has pores. So those pores allow some substances to enter the nucleus and some substances to exit. This is also where we house the genetic material. So this is where the DNA, the majority of the DNA is located. If your cell is not undergoing reproduction and is not getting ready to divide and produce two cells from one cell, then the genetic material is uncondensed and it's called chromatin. So chromatin is DNA plus protein, which is associated with it, that is uncondensed. So it's, it's kind of, let me spell that better. It's not in chromosomes. So it's strand-like, it kind of looks like this. So if you look at a nucleus and a cell is not dividing, it will look like this, okay? So this is my nucleus. This is the nuclear, they call it an envelope, because there's two layers of membranes, a bilayer membrane. And then these are the nuclear pores. And so inside the nucleus is the chromatin. The nucleolus, you do not need to know. Um, it has special um, DNA that codes for a special type of protein in it. So you just need to know, on um, this particular diagram, the nuclear membrane, the pores, and then the chromatin. Now you'll notice that there is um, another membrane that is associated with the nuclear membrane. And what this is referred to is as the endoplasmic reticulum. And this can be abbreviated as ER. So you'll reference to ER, endoplasmic reticulum. So if we think about what this word, what this means, endo means what? Inside? Inside membrane, inside plasma membrane, and reticulate means connected to, to kind of form a network. So this connects to the plasma, it's kind of associated with the nuclear envelope, and it's connected to now, there's actually two types of endoplasmic reticulum. So the one that is shown in this diagram is called rough. So we can call it the rough ER. And so you can think about these internal membranes 
as being partitions, kind of like a factory. Different things are occurring in different parts of the cell. Okay. So in the rough ER, this looks rough when we look at it underneath an electron microscope because it has proteins on its surface called ribosomes. So they say the ribosomes are studded, the, the membrane is studded with these red dots, and those are ribosomes. So it looks rough. This is where proteins that are going to be secreted by the cell are produced. So where secretory proteins are produced. So these are proteins that are going to be secreted like maybe into the blood, right? Or maybe into your digestive tract. So it could be like hormones that are produced and secreted by glands. It could also be um, digestive glands like your pancreas secretes enzymes that go into your small intestine. So these are secreted to out to the outside of the cell. So the smoothie are lax ribosomes. And so it actually has a different function. It's kind of re it's It'll be kind of a near the rough ER, but it um, functions in breaking down toxins and it produces lipids. So your liver will have hepatocytes liver cells that have lots of smooth ER. Your, um, the testes and the ovaries that produce in estrogen and testosterone would have lots of smooth ER because estrogen and testosterone are lipids. So they have two different functions. Um, and so it's just a way to partition the cell as if it were a factory. Okay, so in this diagram, you can actually see the difference between the rough and the smooth ER. So the rough would be with the ribosomes and the smooth is out here um, and it doesn't have any ribosomes on it. I'll show you the diagram from your book in a minute. So you'll, you'll be able, need to be able to identify that. So we have another organelle. So we can put, talk about other organelles. So the ER is an example of an organelle. And this would include what we call the Golgi apparatus. And Golgi actually does not mean anything. It's actually a person. So sometimes you see this apparatus in science, the person that discovers it. Sometimes it's called the Golgi body. Spell that right. <coughs> okay. So the Golgi apparatus functions in um, packaging of secretory proteins. So it packages them. And that is actually what is going on in this diagram. So a protein is produced, it's exported, it's passed to the Golgi apparatus, and then you'll notice that the Golgi apparatus packages it into a vesicle that is then going to pass it to the outside of the cell, and hence it is secreted. And we'll talk about the different mechanisms of secretion um, when we get past talking about the, the organelles. This also produces sugars. Okay. 
So this would include glycogen, so or glucose. Also, sometimes they um, add or our cells will add sugar onto a protein. And so you could get the production of a glycoprotein. So glyco means a sugar plus a protein. And we'll talk about these glycoproteins when we get to the cellular membrane because they are actually really important for recognizing or detecting cell from non-cell. So you can recognize a foreign cell based upon the glycoproteins that are on the surface. Okay, so let's talk about the production of milk. So we have specialized mammary glands as mammals. That is why we are called mammals. And what this does is it allows us to feed our offspring highly nutritious substance through breast milk. Um, and it's just, it's a very good advantage, right? It's a, instead of having to go out and hunt for food like birds do, we, could, we have food readily available. The interesting thing is, is, is that both males and females have mammary glands, but in general, only females will develop them because of their uh, hormonal level. But a while ago, maybe 10 years ago, they, there was a big uh, newspaper article about that's in South America where the males were lactating. So they actually, the male bats actually produced the milk and they looked back at it and they discovered it, that it was due to their diet, that they were eating plants that were high in hormones that were estrogen mimics. And so they were getting these hormones by eating these plants and it was actually causing them to lactate. So it's kind of interesting. But in general, we only lactate when um, prolactin, which is a hormone that's secreted um, at the very end of pregnancy, gets the mammary glands ready to start producing milk. Mammary glands are actually modified sweat glands, and they have ducts, right, that transport it out through the nipple. So let's look at the components of milk. So what is the sugar in milk? Anybody know? What kind of milk, or what kind of sugar is in milk? You see this all the time on packaging. They say, it is wet-free. This milk is wet-free. Lactose-free, right? So sugar, this would be lactose. So that's milk sugar. And it is actually a disaccharide. Okay, so that means that it's composed of two monosaccharides. And so we can break down lactose in the presence of an enzyme into glucose plus galactose. The enzyme that does this is called lactase. Anytime you see ACE on the ending, that suggests that it is an enzyme. That actually means that it is an enzyme. But not all enzymes have that ACE ending. There are some enzymes called pepsin, which digest proteins. That doesn't have the ACE that is an So lactase is what type of molecule? What type of molecule is an enzyme? Protein. It's a biologically active protein. So one of the interesting things about mammals is that the majority of mammals stop producing lactase when they are weaned, right? So if you think about cats and dogs, if you think about sheep and cows and horses, they all are able to digest lactose as young but as soon as they start eating regular food, they stop digesting it, right? So the norm, right, 
what is found normally stop producing lactase at weaning. Okay. So this is what we call lactose intolerance. Okay. It's not a good thing to, even though they love it, it's not a good thing to give your cat or dog milk because they are actually lactose intolerant. They do not produce lactase as adults. And so what lactose intolerance does is it feeds bacteria in your digestive tract and it produces gas and bloating and pain, right? So um, bacteria digest the lactose and this produces gas. Right. So it is painful. Right. So interestingly, if we look at the human populations, most of the human populations around the world are also lactose intolerant. So if you go to Asia, you go to Africa, um, you go to South America, most of those people are lactose intolerant. So where we see a change in genetics is the Northern Europeans. So the Northern Europeans migrated up north and then they became reliant upon dairy milk producing animals. And in order to sustain them um, uh, through the winter, right? So Northern Europeans have a mutation that causes lactase to be produced as an adult. Right? So I have this mutation. A mutation just means it's different from what is normally found in the rest of the world or the rest of the animals. So you can do your 23 and me, right? And one of the things they'll tell you is can you digest lactose? So I have the mutation that allows me to digest. So this mutation was very advantageous, and so we kind of passed it, they, our ancestors passed it on to us, um, and we now um, have that as a prevalent thing in the U.S., because a lot of us are, have ancestors that are Northern Europeans. So if you're not a Northern European, how might you modify your milk products to make them more digestible? What might you do to make milk more digestible to you? You can take out the lactose, but what I'm thinking about ancient times. What do people like in Africa and India, what do they do to their milk? Anybody know? I'm sure you do. They ferment it, right? Right? So we have cheese and yogurt, for example. There's a really good drink called Keeper, which is kind of a bubbly, drinkable yogurt that they put in the, in the um, stores recently. So all of these are fermented. And what that means is that they use bacteria to break it down. It produces gas sometimes proliferately, like in Swiss cheese, right, those gas bubbles or the Swiss bowls, right? But this makes it easier for us to digest. So if you are lactose intolerant, you might be able to eat one of these. Right? So maybe it doesn't make you feel as bad if you eat yogurt. So that's the idea of fermentation. Okay, so if we look at the other product of milk, so this is the first product would be sugar, but milk also has protein in it. Okay, so has anybody made cheese in here? 
So if you take milk and you mix a little vinegar into it, into it, what happens? It solidifies, right? So if I took milk and I mix some vinegar into it, it's going to produce curds, right? Because the protein is going to denature. So the protein comes out of solution and it becomes a solid. So this would be the curds, right? So if you go to the Tillamook factory, you can buy cheese curds, right? That's protein. Um, this is primarily um, a protein called casein. And it is a protein that is produced in the rough ER and secreted by mammary gland cells. So it can be used by the suckling newborn in order to produce its own protein. So, so milk is high in protein. We also have um, antibodies. And specifically in the first milk. Okay. What is the first milk called? Colostrum. Okay. And so the first milk is really interesting because it doesn't look like milk at all. Okay. If you look at it, you're like, it's yellow and it's viscous, but it's kind of watery and it doesn't have any fat in it and it's not white. And um, so the colostrum is specifically important to newborns because it has antibodies in it. Antibodies are an immune protection. And so this is an actually an example of passive immunity. So this will keep the baby from getting sick from microbes or other things that the mother has previously been exposed to and has produced antibodies that then help confer that protection against her, her offspring. But then the babies themselves are going to eventually have to produce their own antibodies upon need. So first milk, um, the colostrum is kind of the most important for immunological, but antibodies are produced throughout milk production. Um, but the milk changes in its constituents as the offspring get older. Okay, so you, they produce different types of things in their milk. Okay. So what kind of lipids do you think are found in um, milk? If you have whole milk, what is it? They have not taken out the fat. Okay. So this is fat. This is saturated triglycerides. This is important because this can be used as with the lactose as a form of energy, right? So the growing op offspring has the lactose, but it also gets fat, which helps in growing. There's an, also a, a type of fat that is found in milk that is believed to be really important <coughs> for brain development. So this is what is called D H uh, E. I have to look it up. Is it A? Okay, D H A. Okay. Okay. So this is important for brain development. And so the most expensive milk in Safeway, right, is the organic milk, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but it also is the organic milk, the whole probably, that has DHA added. So they add that to um, the milk in order to um, supplement. Specifically for young children, this might be really important. I'm not sure so sure it's important for adults. Yep. Whole milk has lots of saturated fats in it, right? So you want to limit your amount, your intake of saturated fat. Um, then you can talk about whole milk, whole milk that's pasteurized versus unpasteurized. So pasteurized means that they killed, they heated it up, and they inactivated all the enzymes. 
from eating, and they've killed all of the living stuff in the milk, like the cells, but they've also killed bacteria. And so by pasteurizing it, they're sterilizing it. And um, some people believe it's easier to digest uh, milk that has not been pasteurized, but it is also more dangerous to digest milk, to take that milk in. I don't think we can do, I don't think we can get whole unpasteurized milk in Oregon. No, you can get Andes. You can buy unpasteurized whole milk in a glass bottle. And it's very, very good. It's directly from the source. And so I think Washington passed a law that they can sell unpasteurized milk, but I don't think you can do it in a word. I don't know how they get away with it. So Washington is the right source. Okay, so we'll stop there for today and we'll talk about, think about where in the mammary gland cell each of these, each of these things would be produced.